If a back workout to you means training your lats and traps, then you may be missing out on the transformative potential of a truly powerful and mobile spine. As they say, you are as young as your spine. Not only can back complaints instantly put an end to athletic careers and normal daily activities, but a weak spine will also weaken every other movement you perform. And the truth is that most people have weak, stiff spines. This is because we spend a huge amount of time sitting with poor posture. When we do get up, we're so out of practice bending and lifting that we move with bad biomechanics. Or we head to the gym and attack these vulnerable muscles with heavy, explosive movements that they are ill-prepared for. These sudden bouts of intense activity shock an exhausted and already weakened and inflexible spine, resulting in injury. So how do we fix this? The first key is to recognise that as the back mechanic Dr Stuart McGill is keen to point out, back pain and injury is usually cumulative rather than instantaneous. The moment you felt the pain was not the moment the injury began, that was merely the straw that quite literally broke the camel's back. The issue is long-term degeneration. The spine itself is actually surprisingly weak capable of withstanding only around 20 pounds of force before collapsing. What provides the crucial stiffness, the separation and a stable base from which all movement can occur is the amazing strength of the muscles surrounding it. The muscles of the spine work the entire day to keep you upright. The erector spinae handle extension, backwards bending, and work as antagonists to the rectus abdomini, the six pack, maintaining a delicate pull in either direction to support an upright posture, just as the quadratus lumborum do on either side. Then there's the multifidus. The multifidus muscles are a group of short, deep bilateral muscles that are arranged along the spine. These work in conjunction with the rotators, with an extra E, and were believed to be unimportant until relatively recently, demonstrating once again just how little we really know about the body. We now know that these muscles serve a crucial role in stabilising and stiffening the spine. They contribute both to extension and to lateral flexion and rotation, and contain fibres that are stiffer and stronger than any other fibres in the human body. These muscles act in an anticipatory manner, bracing the spine against other movements in the body. To this end, they contain an abnormally high number of muscle spindles, thus providing proprioception. The problem is that they're so underused by most of us that we've deadened this awareness of our posture. Contrary to popular belief, the transverse abdomini does not provide local stability in the spine, but rather a global tension throughout the core, which is not to say it has no benefit. The lats even play a role in spinal and core stability, as we discussed in a previous video. These are the muscles we must train in order to strengthen our spine, and therefore to make every single movement more powerful and more stable. A good starting point is to train the muscle endurance of these areas, especially as stabilizers. Seeing as these muscles work throughout the day when we're moving, and undergo unusual patterns of activation when we're sitting, they're particularly vulnerable to injury when it comes to explosive powerful movements at the gym, or when carrying heavy things around the home. You might have powerful glutes and quads to drive you through that squat, but if your spine is tired after a long hard day or unresponsive due to hours of sitting, then this is the weak link that is going to snap. One great exercise to counter this issue is Bird Dog, which as a parent makes me think of a Mog book. Let me know in the comments if you get what I'm talking about. This movement involves getting onto all fours and then extending one hand forwards and the opposite leg backwards. This requires stabilisation in the spine, training the multifidus muscles. You can hold this position for long durations, thereby gaining that much needed mind-muscle connection and strength endurance to keep the spine stable and protected. This is also where the beauty of many so-called functional exercises become apparent once again. When you perform a cable punch or a one arm to press, you must brace the spine to counteract the force. This is again how we punch and push in real life, not lying down as we do in a bench press. Lizard crawls and one armed push-ups have a similar benefit. Although prone, they challenge you to brace under a variety of different positions and support structures, preventing rotation, flexion, etc. Performed mindfully, this also helps to reawaken sensitivity of the spine, to train it to be aware of how we're moving and to react and brace accordingly. This is why I like to slow the lizard crawl right down and move in all directions in an unpredictable manner. One-armed rowing movements are also useful, such as the bent dumbbell row, or one-armed bodyweight row with rotation. These have a stabilising element, while also challenging the spine under heavy loads. Remember that you should be easing into these movements if you aren't used to them. Easier variations exist for everything, from one-armed wall push-ups to bear crawls. Then there are carries and farmer's walks. These train muscle endurance and stabilisation in an upright position, helping the erector spinae to keep you in a good posture for long durations. This is useful seeing as it's how we're supposed to use the spine in the first place. If you can walk long distances holding weights and maintain a strong neutral spine, then you should have no problem blasting out a few squats, or carrying your kid to the car especially if you're using a unilateral variation such as the suitcase carry, or perhaps a front-loaded carry. 
Train this at the end of a workout, not at the start. Fatiguing your core muscles this way before attempting a deadlift is inviting injury. Running is another extremely useful tool. When running, you should focus on keeping your body in an upright position. This is actually why many people injure themselves when attempting a 10K for the first time, or similar. They are simply unable to maintain proper posture when fatigued. Practice this by slowly increasing your distance while being mindful of your biomechanics. We can also actively train extension using movements like the Superman. Of course, this involves lying flat on your face and then raising your hands and legs, effectively balancing out all those sit-ups and dragon flags. Except here's where the controversy comes in. Some experts, like Stuart McGill, advise against the Superman move and others like the Roman chair, stating that these place too much compression on the spine. He recommends the bird dog as a replacement, though this doesn't offer much in the way of anti-flexion and is really more of an anti-rotation movement. I personally also perform the back bridge, which is a fantastic movement for quickly restoring both shoulder mobility and thoracic mobility. This is a static stretch, so don't do it before the rest of your training. I'm also partial to the Hindu press-up or dive bomber, which I think are great movements for their ability to combine both the pushing workout and mobility training. Keep in mind that both these and the back bridge place compressive force on the spine and thus also aren't recommended by everyone. The issue that the likes of McGill have here is with long-term microfractures that can build up with extended use. Don't use these, at least to begin with, if you have any back complaints and consider starting with the short bridge on your shoulders. Honestly though, yogis and Indian wrestlers have been using movements like these for decades with mostly good things to show for it. But your mileage may vary, so think about what you want to achieve, listen to your body and proceed with caution. Even more controversial is the Jefferson Curl, which Dr. Stu also does not love. He believes it's useful for sport specific training as a gymnast, but not for the general population. This movement is key in gymnastic strength training though, and is heavily promoted by the likes of Coach Summers. The movement is akin to a straight legged deficit deadlift meaning that you're standing on a slightly raised platform, but here the aim is to allow flexion in the spine and to imagine each vertebrae unfurling as you move through your complete range of motion. Keeping the chin tucked the entire time, you then contract the glutes before gradually reversing the movement back upwards. As you can probably guess, you use a very light weight for this one. So should you use Jefferson curls? I would say that if you have any history of back pain, then certainly approach with extreme caution. Personally, I believe that strengthening muscles through their entire ranges of motion can only be a good thing but it also depends on individual lifestyles and goals, and there are safer alternatives that we'll get to in a moment. But you see, we can't really talk about extension without also discussing thoracic mobility, because while the lumbar spine should be very stiff to reduce degradation, the middle of the spine, the thoracic spine, should have decent mobility for twisting and bending in both directions. While many of us are afraid to bend our spines, especially under load, the truth is that the spine is clearly designed to move this way. Try moving your body without bending or twisting the spine at all and you'll find you are significantly less agile and functional. A little flexion in the spine is almost inevitable in daily life during movements like picking up a child out of a cot or unloading the dishwasher, especially for untrained individuals. Then there are racket sports and countless other activities that require rapid extension and twisting as part of the stretch shortening cycle. And guess what? If you have a stiff thoracic spine then it's the lumbar spine that's going to bend instead. But what can we use to regain some mobility here that isn't quite so controversial? This is where more animal movement type training can really shine again. The crab walk and tabletop movements for example will gradually increase mobility in the spine whilst also serving as a beneficial anti-flexion movement. I'm also a big fan of the crab reach. This movement also provides some thoracic rotation, which you can likewise get from the windmill. Another option recommended by McGill is cat camel. Here you rest on all fours and simply move the spine from an arched position to a concave one. So that's a heck of a lot of information, and much of it is contradictory. So what do I actually recommend you do if you want to develop better spine mobility, strength and resilience? My recommendation is to start by adding stability exercises in all planes of motion. Any combination of the following will do great. Pile off press, bird dog, dragon flag, lalan push up, ab roll out, one armed standing cable row, cable punches, suitcase carry, one armed push up, lizard crawls, and goblet or zercher front carry. This is fairly uncontroversial and should provide performance benefits and prehab. Throw in some endurance tasks like running and skipping, being mindful to keep the back upright at all times, and you've got a great recipe for a strong and stable back. You should also strengthen the hamstrings and the glute using movements like the glute bridge to take pressure off the spine. Training thoracic extension, rotation and mobility with tabletop, crab walks, cat camel, windmill and the bridge reachover is also advisable. But if you're after next level mobility and control, you can also try the back bridge, Jefferson curl or Hindu push up. But be aware of the caution surrounding these exercises and use at your own risk. Of course, this isn't to undermine the importance of 
deadlifts and kettlebell swings and other more conventional ways of training the lower back. And also, of course, all of those core exercises, whether it's V-ups or hollow bodies. But the point is that this isn't enough on its own and there's lots more you can do to supplement that training if you want to give yourself a more resilient and performant spine. If you have any back complaints at all, then see a professional. There's no advice you can get from the internet that will be particularly tailored to your specific injury and biomechanics. And without being seen by an expert, any exercise regime may make matters worse or might overlook a serious issue. Keep in mind that nothing is set in stone and we're still learning. As you can see here, the experts are pretty much unanimously in disagreement with each other. Even seemingly simple assumptions, such as the importance of the S curvature of the spine, have been challenged. Author Esther Gockhell is among those who believe that the natural position of the spine should actually be more akin to a J. Observations of young children, indigenous tribes and historic sculptures all seem to support this notion, compelling though circumstantial evidence. The danger, I believe, is to get too wed to the advice of any one expert to the point of ignoring contradictory information. Gently integrate ideas from every source and see what works for you. This should be a good starting point for most people and whatever you do, it's a million times better than doing nothing at all. And while all this disagreement might be discouraging, there is a silver lining. It means that if you've been trying to fix a back complaint for years, there might still be someone out there with a different approach that works for you. Or perhaps there's a new discovery just around the corner that can help. If you have back pain, then it has to have a cause. The point is that there's almost always a solution out there, which probably involves some kind of movement. Your mission is to find the right person with the right options for you, so don't give up. So hope you found this video useful and interesting guys, if you did then please leave a like and share it around, that helps me out immensely. Subscribe if you want to see more like this, and if you like the idea of training for true functional performance that you can use in the real world and focusing on much more than just a few lifts or cardio, then you'll probably enjoy my ebook and training program, Super Functional Training. There I go into great detail discussing how different forms of training can improve the mind and body, and then combine all this into a single training program that should help to improve your performance and health across the board. There's a link to that in the description down below and there's a big discount on right now whilst we're all stuck in lockdown. Whatever the case, thank you so much for watching this one and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching and bye for now.